Thanks, Jeff. Hi. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hi. That's so much better. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I got the call last night from Pastor Richie uh, that he wasn't feeling well. He'd been sick all week and thought he might be able to pull it together, and, but he just wasn't feeling up to it. So he called me last night. And uh, since my primary role at Calvary Chapel Chattanooga is an assistant pastor, well, I kind of sort of step into any situation that Pastor Frank might need, whether it's planned or unplanned. It's just kind of one of the roles that I carry. So coming and helping out last minute with Pastor Richie was a, is a blessing. And last night I got on to sermons.com, uh, you know, easy, quick messages. And I thought, okay, the cheapest, I don't even have to be that good because it's late, so I can pick the cheap one. And so uh, we're going to talk about divorce. <clears throat> No, listen, I had, the, I had the recently actually taught the weekend services at Calvary Chat, and, uh, and, and I really did think, you know, um, well, I just recently taught this. Uh, that's typically, if I get called upon kind of the last minute, I'll quite often do that. I'll just go to the, the most recent one that I've taught, and that happened to be a topic. But I spent some time in prayer and, and uh, decided that it was probably the right one to go ahead and, and do. And we actually, at Calvary Chapel in uh, Chattanooga, we had a pretty overwhelming response uh, to the message in a very positive way. It's probably going to be different than what your heart is expecting if you've ever sat through a church service on this particular topic. But it stirred up some very needed conversations and some very healthy things have come out of it. So, Because like you guys, our practice is to go through the Bible, through the books of the Bible. And uh, I happened to pick it up at Mark 10, verses 1 to 12. And uh, you know, I, you, you know, you're probably thinking, you know, is that really a good idea as a guest speaker, you know? You come in, and I, I kind of had that same thought at Calvary Chat. You know, really, Lord, can Pastor Frank, can, can we just, like, can we skip it? You know, is there any way I can get someone else to do this one? And, but you know what? I don't know you guys, so I don't really have any horses in the race, right? I, I mean, I don't even know your situations. Nobody can walk it here. Someone told that guy about, I don't, know your, I don't know how messed up you are. So, But Jesus did teach on it, right? So because he did teach on it, I think I'm pretty safe to, uh, to do it. But I, I faced, in the morning I was coming in, Saturday morning, I'm coming in to teach a message on divorce, and our church posts social media pictures that are anticipatory of the coming weekend's message. And so this is the picture that was given for me to teach from, yeah. <laughs> Calvary Chat, that feeling when you realize it's the weekend, and there are four services at Calvary Chat. We're all smiles because it's a great weekend to talk about divorce. No, it doesn't, it doesn't say that. I gotta tell you, I actually called, our social media department is not that out of touch, okay? I called them and said, listen, you gotta help me out. I need a post that's like really happy because that's all the happy they're getting this weekend. So can you give them a post that's happy? And I did have a picture I wanted to submit as the one, this is what I wanted to put up. <clears throat> <laughs> that's mine and my wife's 34th wedding anniversary picture uh, right there. So <laughs> this year, hey, we're actually celebrating our 35th this month and this weekend we're actually just, we've been out having a fun time celebrating our 35th wedding anniversary. So, so let's clap for her because she's put up with me for 35 years, huh? Now you guys have already heard this verse, but I'm gonna read it to you anyway. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse three. His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and good goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So the text is telling us that through growing in our knowledge of Jesus and a greater understanding of the scriptures and the promises that are written in scripture, we can participate in a divine nature and then by doing so, we can avoid the pain and the, the issues that can come from following our own desires and our own nature. And if there's any, ever a topic or, or, or relational uh, impact that we have to deal with as a result of our own desires and nature, it certainly has to be divorce. It's just a, it's just a yucky topic. And though it would be nice to avoid it, I, I am happen to be one who's very thankful that uh, Jesus didn't shun away from it because far too many of us have been affected by this. Now, I, I know you guys are a young church in the sense that you not, haven't really been gathering for that long, 
but nonetheless, would you consider yourself a family? Who would consider this church your, your church family? 17 of you. Uh, I'll tell Pat. No, you guys, you guys all consider this your church family. You guys are family members. And so today we're going to press through a difficult topic. But I want to do something as a result of a conversation I had with a young man prior to the first time that I taught this. Because listen, he came up to me as we were talking about what was coming for the weekend and I shared with him, I'd be talking on divorce and this is what he said, he goes, divorce isn't really a topic that matters to a bunch of people. I mean, even, even half the people that get married stay married. A lot of people won't even be there that have been through that. So, so how, how, do you, how do you reconcile taking the, uh, 2,000 people through a message that you know, a third of them might identify with? But I, I wanna do something this morning and I wanna be able to do it without shame because you think you're a family. And because I believe that you're a family. And I want to break what has over and throughout the years become an inappropriate stigma of guilt that many have carried. So listen carefully to these criteria. If you are here today and you have had your parents divorce, your family has been through it, your mom and dad have divorced, maybe once, maybe twice. Maybe you were affected by your own divorce. Maybe you've been through it yourself. Maybe you today, right now, this week, in this season, in June of 2019, you are currently walking with, praying with, weeping with, and going through a painful and grieving process with a confused friend who is contemplating whether or not they should have a divorce, or maybe you're with someone who's filed and they're right in the midst of it. I wanna do something, can you do this with me? If you fit into any of those categories and you consider yourself a family member, just stand up. I would be standing if I was sitting. Just stand up this morning. No shame, no guilt. Your family's been through it. Your parents have been through it. Perhaps you've been through it. Or you know someone now who is currently going through it. Look at this, half the church on their feet. Now everybody else stand with them. Let's all stand together. And I had a reason for doing that. Because we've stood together. We've done so around a difficult topic that the church has used to shun and shame. It's one that the devil has used to divide and destroy. But we have chosen today as a small symbol of unity to stand up and identify with everybody who's been affected by this particular act in the lives of those in your family and friends. And as we look around, it's undeniable how many people have gone through it. And I promise you right now, of those who did not stand, I promise you a vast majority would have wanted to, but because of the guilt and shame that's been placed on them, chose not to, I promise. That has been an overwhelming conversation I've had with people that followed the, the, the teaching this last time that I gave it. But it's nonetheless a, a, a topic that we have to face. But here's what I wanna do with you. I ask you to stand for more than identification. When, it, when I teach men, or I teach children, or young, young adults, there's a thing I like to do that I'm gonna ask of you to do with me this morning. And it's, it's just a physical posture of a, a recognizing an openness in your heart to hear the Lord on this. And so I'm gonna close my eyes, I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna ask this of you. I'm gonna ask you to do something for some, it's gonna be very natural and normal. For others, it's gonna be uncomfortable. But all I'm gonna ask is whether all you can do is put your hands here, or you can take them here, or you can take them as high as you can, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands, and like a cup, as an, a physical symbol of being open to the Lord, I'm gonna ask you to, to pray with me this morning. So you take the posture you're comfortable with. Father, this morning, we as a church, we stand this morning, many of us have stood and said that this topic has affected our lives. And it's affected us in a way that for some, like, Lord, like me, the, the, the impact of my parents' divorce on my life and my siblings' lives. Lord, I thank you and ask you this morning that even as I share from the word of God that for myself and others who have been through that, that new wisdom, new insight, maybe mercy and grace and healing, even healing would be present. Lord, we lift our hands to those of us this morning who have been through it for whatever reason, not, not dissecting why we've been through it, but just that we have. Lord, we raise our hands and we ask you if there's even a, a vestige, a shred, a, just a, on any level in our hearts that need needs to be touched and healed and restored and refreshed by you in this topic. God, I pray that you would have our hearts open to hear that. And Lord, for those whose hands are up right now, not for their own life, they didn't experience, their parents didn't experience it, but they have a friend. They're mourning with, they don't know what to share with them. They, they, they feel and, and, and understand their pain, but they need your wisdom. Lord, we raise our hands on their behalf and we would ask that you would pour out upon them 
gifts of discernment and wisdom, the supernatural ability to understand and, and speak from your holy word into those situations. So God, we thank you that Jesus, you didn't shy away from this topic and that today in this year, there's many that deal with it. And so we as a church, hands lifted, ask you to let this be the recognition of our hearts. We are open to hearing from you today. And the church would agree by saying in the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, thank you for doing that. Let's uh, open our Bibles to Mark chapter 12, or chapter 10. <clears throat> and I'm gonna read it in its entirety, and then we'll go back through it. So Mark chapter 10, verses one to 12. And then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And a multitudes gathered to him, and again, as he was accustomed to, he taught them. The Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? And he answered and said to them, well, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And in the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if the woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. I have three goals uh, this morning with you. Uh, three things I'd like to try to move through in this particular order. The first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna unpack for you exactly what Jesus was doing when the topic was brought up. What was he physically about? What was he, he in, the, in the midst of processing when he was asked the question? The second thing I wanna make is just purely an observation. It's regarding the placement of the text in scripture. As I, if I look at the, the bookends, when I look at Mark 10 verses one to 12, well, what did he begin to talk about in verse 13 and on, and what did he talk about at the end of chapter nine? So I'm gonna look at the bookends that surround this topic of Mark 10, one to 12. But then third, I'm gonna look at the, the text specifically, like exactly what is it that, we, that he says on it. So. If you're a note taker, the first thing I wanna do is ask this. Well, what was Jesus doing when the topic of divorce was brought up? Now, Mark is very clear that he points out that he was teaching. Now, this story also unpacks, is unpacked for us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19. And Matthew points out that he was teaching, but Matthew points that at the same time, he was healing. So surrounding the topic of teaching on divorce, Jesus is engaged in two things. He's engaged in teaching, and he's engaged in healing those he is teaching. And this morning, if divorce has become a part of your story, either your divorce, or your parents, or your children, or you're dealing with someone in it, listen, you need to know nothing's changed. The Lord still desires to heal, and if you're contemplating, he is able to heal your marriage. And he is still teaching on the process of what this is about. If, you have, if, if, if you're here this morning and you have felt like less, like damaged goods, I've had many people say to me this, this almost exact phrase, you know, I know that he has forgiven me, but I've been taught that he can never use me. He says this to you. He says, you know what? Yes, I hate divorce. But listen, the scriptures never say you will never be able to twist, spin, point to, or, or in any way say, God ever said, I hate the divorced. He doesn't say it. He says, my grace will simply have to be enough because my grace is always sufficient. And while I have no doubt when we read the text that says he was healing, I have no, no doubt he was healing the blind eyes and lame feet and leprous isolation. Jesus was healing all of that. But if you study the scripture and his healing process, what you oft find is Jesus was more, gave more attention to healing what we couldn't see. There may have been physical healing, but it was always attached to what he wanted to do within the heart of the person who needed to be healed. He was always, or not always, he was most often concerned about the wounds that are not so obvious that we carry. And for some, for some this weekend, the only thing, the only thing that will free you 
from the bitterness of your divorce is the healing touch of Jesus. And so today, he's still teaching and he's still healing. I pray you'll be open to both. Now, the second thing. The second thing is the placement of the text. As I said a moment ago, the bookends, if you will, of Mark 10. So in Mark 10, or Mark 9, Jesus ends with a teaching on causing children to stumble and the severity of a, of, of a witting or unwitting result of your choices. That's in the end of Mark, Mark 9. When he picks it up in verse 13, on the other side of Mark 10, 1 to 12, Jesus teaches on hindering children and come, from coming to him and, and the import of us emulating children in our approach to him. Very clearly, Jesus, as Jesus is teaching on divorce, he is drawing our attention to the decision that we make and the effect that it's going to have on our kids. Teaching on children are at the bookends of this topic. And that should shed some light onto why God said, as I quoted earlier, when he says he hates divorce, the entirety of the text says this, I hate divorce, says the Lord, Malachi 2, verse 16, the God of Israel, to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart and do not be unfaithful to your wife. Perhaps today we could consider that the, the, this God of love, creator of the marriage covenant, and inspiration behind the blessing of children, hates divorce not because he doesn't understand your circumstance, but because he knows our children rarely do understand them, and they're the ones off left to deal with the aftermath. Now, because there is no period or comma placed willy-nilly or randomly in the Bible, God, at the very minimum, is drawing our attention to the impact that divorce has on kids. And as a result of that, it behooves me to point it out to you as both a, a, a pastor and a counselor of 35 years. It, point, it, it behooves me to point out to you to say at least this. If you're navigating divorce, and it's the last and final option, and there's, you, 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 there's no other choice, you've got to go through it, and you've got kids, at least get wise godly counsel beyond yourself when navigating the divorce with your children involved. I have just found in my experience, and any counselor would tell you this, that we have found that it's just very difficult to be truly objective and not project your own pain onto your children. And we, I understand, listen, it is natural. It's a natural thing to do since you want so desperately to get away from this man or woman that you, this protective nature would come in and you would want your children to be away as well. Even in cases where couples would say, well, he's a good father or she's a good mother, the instinct is still to protect and you can cause harm in the children's lives unwittingly. So it's just really wise, it's really wise to draw in outside godly counsel. We see it constantly in the, in the, uh, in the counseling room and youth pastors would say, we're dealing with it uh, from the children's perspective. So it's just, the Lord is at the very minimum saying, hey listen, if you're gonna go through this, get some other eyes on it that may help you to have a perspective that your pain is keeping you from seeing, legitimately, that your pain is keeping you from seeing. Now third, to the text specific. As was often the case of the religious, their question really was made with regard only to how they could spin his answer. Matthew 19, it gives us a, 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 a little bit greater detail, if you will, into the, the question that they actually asked. Here's, here's how Matthew 19 says it. It says, is it lawful to divorce, uh, for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? That's how they asked the question. And Jesus, to, to have answered yes, it would have pitted him against the rabbi Torah scholar, Rabbi Shammai, who believed that divorce was only allowable if sexual sin was present. But for Jesus to answer no, it would have pitted him against Torah scholar, Rabbi Hillel, who believed or taught that uh, it was a much more obvious, obviously popular view that you could divorce for just about any reason. So they're trying to trap him between these two popular theologians and biblical scholars. And, and uh, I, 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 just, I mean, the second guy, Hillel, can you imagine? You can divorce for any reason. Honey, you burnt the toast. It's the third time. I'm, I'm calling a lawyer. We, we would blame our spouses, on, would, would we not? Who's a, you like to grill? Who likes to grill? Who likes to barbecue? 
I'd say barbecue. Y'all are Southern, right? Barbecue. I, I, I was, I was, I, I like dead meat. And I, I had the, 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 the stainless steel, four foot wide, 25 steak at a time, meat incinerator. And I had this thing, flames boiling outside. I'm in my armor, flipping burgers and killing meat. And in my glory and the smoke and the heat is rising incense before God. And I take the meat off the thing and I put it on the plate and I go walking in the house. And as I was walking in the door, I looked to the right and the vinyl on the side of my house is <laughs> melting off the house because I had the grill too close to the house. So I, oh my gosh. So the next day it cools off, I take the pieces off, I take one piece and I go walking into the vinyl guy to get a new piece of vinyl. And as I'm walking in, I'm carrying this warped piece of vinyl and the guy's making his note, his, whatever he's doing on the counter, he looks up and he sees me with the vinyl and he says, ah, you got the grill a little too close to the house, did you? And I said, yeah, she sure did. You blame our wives. <laughs> but that's what the basis of Hillel was. He's like, whatever the reason, you could divorce. And of course, it was a much more popular view. Listen, it is important to note something here. Jesus ignored their attempt to trap him. And he simply uses the question as a way to minister down through the millennia to everyone who would feel the pain of divorce in your journey for any reason. So he first takes them to the law of Moses as Moses delivered it. And it's important to note he doesn't contradict Moses. He simply explains why Moses took the position that he took and the reference is from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, which says this. When a man takes a wife and marries her and it happens that he find, or she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness, some immoral uncleanness in her and he writes a certificate of divorce, he puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. You see, Moses allowed divorce for moral failure. Very important, not because of the moral failure, but because of a heart that had become hard. So Jesus added to the thought of Moses, not contradicting it. And before he does, he's pointing out that the law doesn't require nor suggest that if there is moral failure, that divorce is mandated, that you have to do it. It doesn't even say that it's suggested or recommended. And it certainly doesn't say, as some have come to believe, that it's actually led by God. Because some, and as we've walked with people, have, have in pain, I get it, in their pain, they have filtered their decision to divorce through the belief, the errant belief, that God is leading them to it, that he even inspired it to protect them. But what we're gonna soon see is God has never led anyone to divorce. But there are very specific circumstances that God allows it. Not so much with his blessing, but as much with his understanding of the human journey the near irreparable damage that certain circumstances bring, God in his mercy understands the human heart. And if there's anything that's going into this weekend's message that I am sure of, it's that there's a host of people who have been through it or are considering it, or at least if they're Christians, they're asked this question, do you have biblical grounds? Well, throughout history, throughout church history, Sexual immorality, or specifically as it manifested in adultery, uh, Matthew 5.32, that was one that the church typically would say this is something that the Lord in his mercy allows. Abandonment is the other one in 1 Corinthians 10, 7 through 16. But Jesus here recognizes that divorce does actually happen for other reasons. And then he gives the consequence. If it happens for these other reasons, then there's a consequence. That's simply what he's doing. And that is that to remarry is to commit adultery. So if that, now if that just, that's where so many of us stop, as if that's the only place Jesus teaches on this. But if we were to look at Matthew 19, let's look at Matthew 19, verse 8 and 9, and then we're going to jump over to, uh, I think, John. But Matthew 19, he reiterates, he reiterates what I just said. Matthew 19, so you don't think this is coming from me. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, 
permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. See what he did? He took it back to the single issue, not the multiple issues, but the hardness of the human heart. And I say whoever divorces his wife except for sexual morality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So the question arises, well, what about physical or mental or emotional abuse? What about financial ruin or broken trust? What about pornography? Is that enough of a sexual immorality? What about uh, we made a mistake or we've fallen out of love? And, you know, as I penned this, you know, a month or so ago, I was tempted to address a lot of those until I revisited the text and I realized all of those reasons were present when Jesus was asked the question, but he didn't feel the need to address them. He, he, his answer doesn't need my defense or clarification. So I decided what I would rather do is focus on what he did. What, were, what did he focus on? What was his heart for sexual, and what was his heart for sexual sin, adultery, or any moral failure? So I took the text that he said, I just wanted to comment on it, but now I want to take you to another place where Jesus says, okay, if this is a part of your journey, how do I view that? How do I look at that? And instead of me telling you, let's look at together at John 8, verse 3. Let's just go to John 8, verse 3. And then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Now again, notice what they're doing. Um, but they said this to test him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and rode on the ground. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And Jesus spoke to them again. He said, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I tell you, as a pastor and walking with people through this in so many years, one of the things that breaks my heart so much is that people stay in this place of feeling like I'm divorced, I'm somehow the exception to God's grace. And it's just not enough for me. And the church, that doesn't come from the world, that comes from the church. And I know it breaks my heart, but I know it really breaks God's heart because he just spoke to a woman here, no denial that she did what she was doing, no denial that she'd made mistakes and even conscious choices. But he said, where are your accusers? Well, I don't have any more, they've all left. Well, then I don't condemn you either. Now here's the key, go and sin no more. Go and make changes. Don't do this again. Go and make, so fruit to righteousness, but be free in the understanding that my grace is sufficient for you and do not live any longer under the bondage of those who hold stones. And I just think that's a powerful truth. So if you can simply agree with what Jesus said in Matthew 19, then receive the grace that's offered in John 8. Now, what I'm about to say, I want you to understand, is said with the greatest of compassion. And I have absolutely, there's not a shred, I have zero judgment intended. It is said with the understanding that I can, only, I can only recognize and I can only validate the pain that you've been through. I can't really truly understand it because I don't live in your world and uh, I, I've not been through divorce. But in Jesus taking these men, if you will, back to the law of Moses, and his allowance for divorce, and he points out, as I said earlier, the reason giving being that of a hardened heart, the reason that divorce was allowed, even under Moses' time, was because the hardness of a human heart. And I've seen this so many times. This constant failure of moral character in a marriage that wounds the heart of both the offender and the offended so much that it becomes altogether too hard to be restored to one another. Proverbs 12a gives us a reason for that. The beginning of Proverbs 12 says this, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. (sighs) 
perhaps there is an answer to your failing marriage. And I don't know you. You guys may all be in a pristine place. I don't know. But perhaps the answer to your failing marriage is in recognizing that maybe there's been no adultery or abandonment or any biblical reason. The reality is that your, the circumstances have just created a heart that has simply become too hard. I've heard far too many wives plead with their husbands to just hear them, to recognize the pain that his actions and decisions are causing them. And then they would have described it to have been like a, like a switch that just gets turned off. It, it, it's not so much that they even had enough or that they consciously chose to give up. It's just they, they've described it to me like literally one day with all my heart I wanted to try, I wanted to continue, and then I, some women have even said I actually physically felt this, this click, this switch turning off, and my heart just became so hard and I was just, I was just done. It was over. I, 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 I just had nothing in me. There, there was nothing in me to, to be able to, to, to go through this a, any longer. And the spiritually manipulative man will say things like, well, your heart has become hard toward me. You need to repent. And you need to ask Jesus to soften your heart. And it's on the rare occasion that these men will see their wife's heart hard and recognize their own role in making it that way. It's easier to judge her for having a hard heart than to face the possibility that you're the one that's caused it to be hard. Now listen, church, while it's true in my experience that it's primarily the wife whose heart gets hardened by the tone-deaf inability and seemingly desireless efforts of her husband, it is by no means exclusively so. In my many years of marriage counseling, I have certainly seen those roles reversed. And it is the wife who has continued to create the hardness of her husband's heart. But I can tell you this. When I have seen hope restored, when I have seen the hard heart softened, it has always, and I want, I'm using that word very intentionally because we're told as preachers, never use absolutes. Don't say always and never, but this is, an, I'm telling you, in my experience, this has been 100% of the time a reality. It has always been the result of the humility on the part of the wife or husband who has a hard-hearted spouse. When they begin to recognize and the accusations stop, and their prayer begins to go like this. The one who has a hard-hearted spouse begins to pray like this. Lord God, my spouse's heart is so hard. Forgive me for my role in it. Show me how to change. And here's the key. Regardless if they ever respond positively to me. Even if he or she doesn't return to me, Lord, forgive me and show me how I've caused them pain that's causing them to do these things. Lord, show me because it's against you that I have sinned. And when that has happened, now I'm not saying that doing that always resulted in a softening of a heart, but I am telling you that every single time I've walked with someone and seen a heart softened, on the other end of that was the person who caused it humbly finally recognizing they did it and then repenting and changing without any hope or expectation that this person's gonna come back to them. When a wounded and hardened heart sees repentance without the expectation of restoration, it creates a hopeful platform for reconciliation. But when a wounded and hardened heart sees repentance with the expectation of restoration, they just view it as another manipulation. You're just saying that to get me back. You're just repenting to get me back. But when they see that brokenness and release that they're the one who's caused it and they just release, then the platform can begin to possibly be there for healing. Now, as was the custom of Jesus, when he was asked sincere questions, he took it to the heart of the issue. He didn't speak to the myriad of reasons that we validate divorce today. He just boiled it down to a hard heart. And to the offender, the answer is humility. And to the hard-hearted, listen, we serve a heart-softening God. Just at least be open to Acts 28, 27, where he says this, for this people's heart has grown hard. 
And with their ears, they can barely hear. And with their eyes, they have closed them. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. I'm not, as I said a, a few moments ago, I'm not judging you for a heart that's hard. I understand it. I grow frustrated at the person that's caused your heart hard. I know that there's pain there. I'm just wanting to point out to you what Jesus does here. A hard heart is present at every single divorce. And a hard heart is no condition for a believer's heart to be in. So just be open to Jesus doing what he has been doing all along when he's asked the question about divorce. Be open to his teaching and open to his healing. Now, after addressing kind of the root of divorce without being drawn into the debate of the myriad of given reasons, I love what Jesus does. He masterfully focuses not on divorce, but what does he do? He starts talking about marriage. And I couldn't help but be drawn to verse 6 of chapter 10 when he said, but at the beginning of creation, God... I love that. He takes the topic of divorce and he takes us back to the time before the fall of man and he told us what marriage was supposed to look like. And I love that because, you know, it is true that we need to understand how to navigate it if it touches our lives. We've already demonstrated at the beginning of the service that so many of us have been touched by it. But wouldn't it be far better to learn how to avoid it and to help others avoid it? Wouldn't it be better, better if you, you single people to prepare yourself so that you can never have that in your, in your life? How many of you guys have taught your kids to drive? I don't even have to ask. It's the people with no hair and gray hair. Everybody, you know, you've taught your kids to drive. I taught, we taught our, we have four kids teaching them to drive. I made it through the first two. The last two we had to pay someone. You know, we just couldn't do it anymore. But it didn't go like this. When I was teaching my my son, Timmy, how to drive, this is not what happened. Now, he was 17 before he started driving, and it it wasn't he was afraid to drive. He was afraid of the responsibility of others. He's always been an other-centered young man. So he was worried about maybe hurting others. So he just, but I did not teach him like this. I didn't say, okay, son, let's get in the car. We get in the car, and I'm like, all right, son, put your hands at 10 and 2. Okay, daddy, 10 and 2. Okay, great. 10 and 2, great. Now put your foot on the right. That's the gas pedal on the right. Brakes on the left. Okay, daddy, gas pedal's on the right, brakes on the left. Use the gas pedal more than the brake. No, no, son, you got to use the brake more than the gas pedal. Go slow. I didn't do it like that. I didn't go, okay, now, are you ready? Ready, okay. Put it in gear. Oh, by the way, you're going to crash. Oh, and son, you're probably going to die, and you're probably going to hurt someone, and it's going to be brutal and blood and guts and gore. So let's go driving, right? No, I didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't say, okay, son, I want to make sure that you know how, listen, if you get in a wreck, make sure you fill out an accident report, make sure you don't say whose fault it is, because even if it's yours, you don't want them to know that. I, I didn't do any of that, right? Now, granted, I did at least say, like, he got, of the 100% of teaching him to drive, he got a 10% talk on what to do if you crash, right? I wanted him to know. But I wanted to spend the majority of my time teaching him how to drive, so it could be fun, and it could be safe, and so that's why I like Jesus. He's like, okay, I had to talk on divorce, but now let me tell you how to drive. Now I'm gonna tell you how to have a great marriage. So that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of our time. We're drawing our attention to what God intended in the beginning, so let's look at the beginning before the fall of sin and implement what we see in in these lives. Let's put that into our lives so that we wouldn't wreck relationships. Look again, Mark chapter 10. Mark 10, verse 6, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So then they were no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So he spends, he takes them back to Genesis chapter 2, because Genesis chapter 2 is the only place in Scripture that talks about what marriage looked like before the fall. So that's what we're going to do. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2, and believe me, there is a lot of truth in here for the unmarried to create a life that others will find attractive. And there's many truths nestled into the text. I'm just choosing seven, because these are seven that I happen to really like. So seven truths. Genesis chapter 2, let's start together in verse 7. Genesis 2, 7. Now, granted, this isn't necessarily an academic theological approach, okay? 
These are parallels and similarities and principles. But let's look at verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. If you're a note taker with me, here you go. Number one, the man's first job was at home. First job is at home. The first thing God did with Adam after making him was create a home for him to live in. Before he gave him a job, before he gave him a wife, he gave Adam a home. Home is the priority. We think men should be off at the battle, building things, creating things, earning an income, conquering and collecting and cultivating. Men build the castle and a woman makes it a home, sort of a thinking process. And I'm not here to talk about breadwinning. I'm just saying that for men to have their eye captured by what's out there, to the neglect of their eye on their home will soon find themselves eyeing homelessness. This is so important that in the early church, it was a criteria to be in ministry. 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5 says this. Speaking of those who are leaders in ministry, he says, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? This isn't speaking about a man who dominates and tyrannically rules his family. Well, it's that way because I said it was that way. No, listen, Mark 9, just prior to Mark 10's teaching on divorce, Jesus' view on great leaders is really clear. He says, listen, your best practice if you want to be a good leader is to be a servant. So I need to be serving my family. We've always made it a priority to provide for my family. I enjoy work. I've always tried to provide for my family. But I don't know. It didn't allow my work to become my focus, to get the best of my energy. Tried to save my best for my home life. Kathy and I have worked very hard at creating a peaceful home. We want our home life. I want my home life to get my effort and to be peaceful because I love naps. <laughs> and Listen, it, it, in the Greek, the word nap comes with a time frame. It's a two-hour minimum. So the 20 minutes, it actually says, is sin and get thee behind me, Satan. So it is a very important, you understand, hearing it from the anointed word of God, two-hour naps, folks, very important. So create a home where two-hour naps are possible. Can I get a glorious amen? amen. Now, none of you are going to do it, but at least you know it's you want to, right? Listen. So Genesis 2.9, first one, home. Man, our, our, our priority should be home. Second one, Genesis 2.9. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here we go. Second, point two. A happy home is a choice. It doesn't just happen because you fall in love and you get married and now it's all, you know, happy and ever at. No, it's a choice. You've got to keep making the right choices. I've discovered a happy marriage, or if you're single, a happy home in life is rarely made or destroyed by one or two huge decisions. It's made so by a thousand small investments. You may have heard the, the saying, death by a thousand cuts. Well, listen, a thousand intentionally positive decisions create a happy home. From the very beginning, before sin was present, there was choice. Before Adam, right there before him were two choices, life or death. Now, we don't know what would have happened if he had eaten of the tree of life. We don't know because he never did. So, but we do know what happened because he chose to eat of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. And so for us, listen, as believers, every day we have to be making positive choices. First, uh, uh, Proverbs 13, 12, I quoted the first part of it to you earlier. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Let me give you the whole verse. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And so from the very beginning, there is a hope that is eternal, and it is found in the tree of life. And if there ever were a tree that bore fruit worth eating that we often neglect, it was most certainly the tree that is Jesus. John 15, 5, he parallels himself to this, and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So first thing I got to understand is as a, as a man, I've got to make home my priority. And the second thing I have to make my priority is a personal relationship with Jesus. 
I have to make sure that I'm spending time with him, not because I have a box to check, but because I want to be around him. And guess what happens? The more that I'm around Jesus, guess what starts to happen? I start acting more like Jesus. And I treat my wife more like Jesus. Do you know the two things said in my home? The two phrases you hear in my home above any other phrase. You hear the words, thank you, and I love you. We say that constantly. And I bet most marriages that doesn't happen because things become expected. When my wife makes me a meal and I'm sitting in the recliner and I'm watching some scriptural show, I'm sure, Bible, something. Well, I'm, I'm binge, binging on you know, the Bible history and my wife brings me my, my dinner and my Diet Coke and I, I don't say, way to go, woman. Make sure you do it again. She, she learned to do that on her own. No, no, I say thank you. I say thank you, and then guess what? I do the dishes. I, I wash the dishes, and you know what she says? She says, you missed a spot. No, she doesn't. She says, thank you. Be, we appreciate it. We don't ever just assume it. She says, thank, if I don't make dinner, she says, thank you. I don't know what that's about, but nonetheless, point is, thank, and I love you. I don't just assume, well, she knows I provide, and so she knows I love. No, she hears me say it. If I think it, I say it. Well, she thinks that she says it. We're constantly complimenting. Well, there's a thousand small investments. Why? Well, because I'm hanging around Jesus a lot. She's hanging around Jesus a lot, and guess what I hear in my ear all the time? I hear the Lord all the time speaking encouragement to me. So naturally, out of my mouth is going to come encouragement to those around me. Genesis 2, verse 10, for point three. I'm not going to read all of it. It's 10 through 14, but let me just give you verse 10. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden. From there, it parted and became four riverheads. Point three, the Holy Spirit is a home body. Point three, the Holy Spirit is a home body. If there ever was a home body, as if someone, as in someone who prefers being at home above any other location in the world, it's gotta be the Holy Spirit. Now I realize that these are literal four rivers that flowed out of the garden, I get that. But there's a parallel in John 7, 37 to 39 that says, that, let's look at it, John 7, 37. Just to your right a little bit there, John 7. Says this. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out and he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come, come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, the picture to me is really inspiring because there's volumes written Churches that are divided and opinions without number on the role of the Holy Spirit in the church and in the world. But I'm here to tell you the place it's neglected, that I think it's probably the primary place, the, the place above all places the Holy Spirit desires to have his work fulfilled is in my home. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in my home. I want my wife to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the home. We need that. I want spiritual gifts operating in my home. There's a, of the 26 spiritual gifts that are listed, do you know that one of them is the gift of administration? I think we need the gift of administration in our home so we manage our resources well, so that we know we don't get out of balance with do we put our kids in too many sports. I need to administrate our time and our resources well, and sometimes I need the Holy Spirit to guide me to know what has the better eternal impact. I need the gift of helps in my home. We need the gift of helps, why? Because you know what, when you're, at times when you're doing the chores or the work of the house, you can become pushy to get it done or you can become uh, upset that you're being asked to. But if I have the spiritual gift of helps, then it's a joy to pick up Kathy's dirty socks and wash them for her. It's not a burden. That, that was reversed, by the way. It's the other way. But point is this. The point is, listen, if I'm doing the things I'm always having to do and it's mundane, the Holy Spirit can give me a joy in doing it with the gift of helps. Mercy. How many men would you like your wife to have the gift of mercy? T two. This young 10-year-old would like his wife someday to have. That's a very wise young man right there. So you have the word of knowledge, I'm telling you. right? <laughs> Discernment. How many of you guys have teenage kids? Would you like to have the gift of discernment? When you ask the kids, were you at Johnny's last night? Yes, Daddy, I was at Johnny's. Well, the Lord showed me Johnny's name is Susie, and we have a problem, right? I mean, you'd want to have the gift of discernment. You know, I, I, I want to, listen, I like the gift of discernment because I want to know when I ask Kathy is if she's upset and she says no, I want to know 
if she's really upset, <laughs> so I know how to act, right? And who's going to argue that the gift of tongues are appropriate in the home, right? Who's going to argue there? So we're going to move on from that, and I'll let that one sink into a few of you guys. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 Some of you like two in the morning or start laughing on that one. And then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. Okay, here we go. Number four, ready? Work is not a four-letter word. Before sin was present, work was present, and it didn't become hard until after Adam sinned. In God's plan, we are meant to work, to plant, to tend, to grow, and to harvest. I love Pastor Frank has a teaching uh, called A Godly Life is a Filtered Life, and it goes God, family, work, ministry, and I love that. But a huge source of unrest in the home is found when work is out of balance, either too much or too little. If you allow your job, for whatever reason, to nominate your life so that your time with your family is placed in jeopardy, just remember that is your choice. But whatever, extra, but whatever extra you earn, it may very well cost you more than you're willing to pay. And the next one, verse 18, is very similar. Verse 18 to 20. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there wasn't a found a helper comparable to him. Point five, play is not a four-letter word either. I love that before the fall of man, life was full of distractions. There was a lot of stuff meant to play. You see, God tied creating these amazing creatures into the reality that man was alone and that it wasn't good. That's what he said, okay? My question is, when was Adam ever alone? Was Adam ever alone? I mean, the moment he was created, he had the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he walked with the cool... But he was alone. God said he's alone. There's a powerful truth. That's telling us that God has created a space in the human heart that God intends to fill. And guess what? He's created spaces in the human heart he never intended to fill. He's created golf. I know sometimes you don't feel like it. But he's created golf. He's created hobbies and sports and fun and, and art and literature. He's created all that stuff. There's a place that it's meant to fulfill in us. He's also created our wives and our husbands to have a, a place that's fulfilled in us. And in the naming of these animals, the Lord's just showing at them. But then in comparison to, to what he's about to receive from God, all these great things, they're, they're far less. Giraffes and lions and bears and aardvarks and platypuses and uh, the, the, all the variety of the wonderment of the the world, sports and dance and art and music and every hobby, it's all an amazing addition. But I'm going to give you someone to share that with that makes it all so much better. Compared to the joy of the companion God has created for you, all those things are not, not as good. I, I, I love motorcycles. I had a Goldwing for years. I rode most of my life. And I, I wanted the Goldwing because Kathy could ride with me. And I'd have friends say, why you buy a Goldwing? I don't want my wife to go with me. I buy a Harley with a really uncomfortable, tiny little back seat. So they don't, I look, Kathy, we, we would get on that bike and we'd be right, and we have the walkie talkies and we're talking away and, and all of a sudden she'd get quiet and I'd feel this tink, tink, tink. She'd fall asleep and her helmet would be hitting me in the back of the head. You know, fortunately I had the armrest, you know, but the point is we just, it was so relaxing and we loved being together because we learned to enjoy the life that we had with the things that God gave us opportunity to enjoy. Genesis 2, 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which God had taken from man he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Now, I want to preface these last two points with telling you I could teach a sermon on these two alone. And the, 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 the final one is everybody needs it. Pay attention. You live your life by this final one, and you're, it's going to change everything about you. But this one's specifically related to couples. Point six. Fellas, she was created to guard your heart, and ladies, he was created to make you his most important pursuit and person. She was created to guard your heart, and he was created to make you the most important pursuit and person. If you will live under those two principles, life will change. I don't care where you're at in your marriage. 
the value of understanding those truths is perhaps the most powerful force for change in the direction of a marriage. It'll make a bad marriage wonderful and a great marriage even better. Men, listen. Your wife is God's gift of protection over the most important aspect of your life, and it's your biggest blind spot. You've heard it at weddings. God created the woman from the rib, not from the head bone, because if he's created woman from the head bone, it would mean that she ruled over him. But if he created woman from the heel bone, then it would mean that he would rule over her. But he created her from the rib bone to show that they go side by side, they're partners in life, not one submitted to the other without the other submitted to the one. Everybody is together in this, and that's a beautiful picture. But there's a much more deeper and powerful truth. Men, listen. The woman was created from the rib cage because the rib cage is the bone structure that protects your heart. It's the thing that protects what you're most blinded to and unable to see and unable to recognize. And God has given you a wife that will protect your heart. If you're a single person, begin to pray today for your spouse to be that she will be someone that will protect your heart. The value of understanding this I cannot equate to you. I have learned through failure to listen to the wisdom of my wife's heart, to hear her and her gut feelings and her intuitions and at times her emotionally influenced decisions because I learned that God has given her to me, created her for me to protect me from one of the greatest threats of my life's journey, the decisions and actions that are harmful to my heart. I needed Kathy to help me keep my heart focused on Jesus and my family. When I was pastoring uh, you know, 300 people and I had a, a, a company with 15 employees and we had four kids in sports and we're going through all that, I, I longed to be, I loved being with my family, but I constantly needed my wife and her voice to redirect my heart from these other successes so that I could stay focused on where it was supposed to be because she knew that's where my heart wanted to be. But it was easy as a man to get my fo focus drawn away. She has protected me from far more personally harmful decisions, decisions that would have corrupted my heart with bitterness or envy on any number of damaging choices. And fellas, listen, if you want to enhance or restore your marriage, Make sure that she knows, not that you think it, but you ask her, and it, ask her to be honest with you. She need, you need to know that she knows that she's the most important pursuit and the most important person in your life. I've been telling Kathy for decades, if she ever left me, I was going with her. <laughs> I'm following. Why? Because that's what it means when he says, she's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It means that caring for her, pursuing her happiness, her health, her, her, her dreams, my life depends on pursuing her things that benefit her. What an incredible truth. See, the more that I serve her, the more that I understand her, the more that I listen to her, the more that I invest time in her, the more that I discover what she wants in life and help those dreams to become a reality, the more that I make sure that those things happen for her and she believes that she's the most important person in pursuit, listen, the more that she knows those things, the more she feeds my need for respect. She shows me respect. The more that she empowers me the more that she believes in me, that she encourages me, that she inspires me to greater ventures of faith and sacrifice and achievement, the more that I choose to see her being invested in. Now, the final point, final takeaway, and this is the one, I, if you get nothing, take this with you. It will, it will change so many things about your life. To verses 24 and 25. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Here it is, point seven. Plan on having nothing to hide, or plan on hiding nothing, and you will have nothing to hide. Plan on hiding nothing, and you will have nothing to hide. Now, I, I know you guys don't know me, but I do want to peel back the curtain and tell you a little bit what was going on in my mind when I was writing this. So I wrote that, and I thought, that sounds very theological. But here's what I wrote first and had to change. First, I typed out, okay, point seven, the buzz, see, point seven, they were both naked, and the man and his wife, they're no shame. Okay, point seven, get naked. Oh, no, that's not, no. De de delete, 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 and start to, okay, no, okay, try it again. Expose yourself. No, no, that's not. Delete, delete, delete. So I thought, no, I better, go with, I better go with plan on hiding nothing and you will have nothing to hide. Just sounded much more theological and I knew I wouldn't get uninvited back if I used the other two. But, <laughs> but listen, you need to know that that verse 
for years was the opening verse on my cell phone. You guys have like a picture when you hit your button and a picture comes up? That verse I had on my cell phone for probably close to four years. It was the screensaver. Every time I would open up my phone, it would say Adam and his wife were both naked and they were were not ashamed. And so all day, every day, multiple times in the day, I was reminded of hoping to end my day naked before my wife without shame and not in a physical sense. But having, listen, this is what I meant. Quit snickering. Listen, having every, in every, listen, in every thought, in every action, in every conversation and interaction, in everything that I looked at in public and everything I looked at in private and every woman I encountered and everything in my day, that if, at the, if I began my day with the hope that it all could be exposed to my wife at the end of the day and I could not be ashamed, that was gonna be a good day. If I could plan it that way. And I'm not talking about using her as my priest, some way to to, to confess my failures to. I'm talking about living with purpose and reason not to fail. This is a powerful principle for the married and the unmarried. Choosing to live in such a way that if your day was laid naked before someone that you loved, you would have nothing to be ashamed of. Truly, if you plan on it, starting the day on hiding nothing, you will have nothing to hide. So listen, I saved my sermon title for the end on purpose. Divorce has touched way too many of us and in so many ways damaged and brought us generational pain. Jesus has clearly pointed out the greatest potential damage done and he's offered his thoughts on an atmosphere of healing and then he took us back to the beginning and he used it to remind us of God's original plan to a time, and here's the title, before divorce was an option. So maybe a closer look at how God meant it to be will help us to remove divorce as an option again. And at least if you can apply nothing but point seven, that will filter into all these other areas. And with that, can I pray for you? Jeff, you can come on up. Father, I just want to thank you for the truth of your word, the powerful principles given to us for this sweet church whose hearts you've prepared each week to hear from your word and that today has been uh, no different. Your word we've tried to honor. Uh, I thank you, Jesus. You never allowed yourself to be drawn into a trap of answers, but you always spoke to the heart of the matter. So I would pray for the chapel, Lord. I don't know these sweet saints and which ones may be struggling in their marriages or if anybody is struggling in their marriages. I don't know. But Lord, for some reason, you allowed your servant, uh, Richie, to become ill and this sermon to be preached. And so we would simply ask that this body of believers would be open to both your teaching and your healing. And that everybody, whether they're married or not, would take a look at these principles and begin to live their lives in a way with their interactions with others and even in their home in such a way Well, Lord, that they could begin and end their days on just a really good note so the day could end without anything having needed to be hidden. Bless these saints, Lord, as they serve you in Jesus' name. Amen.